within that public grants process. But behind the scenes, there are private grants going out too. So we have administered grants for Alcoa, for Caterpillar, um, and National Geographic. And if you don't have your fundraising pages built, you don't, get qual don't qualify for those because we don't know what you're doing and we don't know what your need is. So back to the fundraising pages. Make sure you're visible on our website. So this year alone, we sent a million dollars down to the chapters to do projects. So EWB USA is no longer a nickel and dime organization. We bring in a significant amount of money and we want to send it to you guys, but we need to know what you're doing. We've provided a lot of marketing materials and you've seen this over the past couple of years. If you want to make a ball cap, you don't have to redo the logo because it's the templates out there for you. If you want to create business cards, the templates there for you. So those are all available via the website and they're updated with um, organizational statistics as they change. And we have an annual report each and every year. And what you find in that annual report is really handy information that your donors want to know. So use this annual report. It's on the website. Take it. Give it to your donors, especially the bigger donor. They want to know that you're part of the national organization and how we account for every dollar that gets spent in the community. In that annual report, we tell them how we invested the dollars. We tell them who our award recipients are. We list our partners. We listed our grants funders. And we have stories of impact. And these are the premier chapters um, and projects that we were given awards last year. So use that annual report. We create it for you all to use it. And as I said, the 2012 year-end campaign is right around the corner. And our goal is to raise $500,000 together. And that's a highly doable goal. Last year, we raised $570,000. The campaign theme is around making the connection. And like last year, it will begin November 28th and run until January 15th. We'll have all the details available for you on November 15th, which makes it very important for you to get the news, the e-blast. And the matching funds we're raising right now are coming from corporate partners and our board of directors. And as I said, we're at 125,000 now. We started at 86,000 two weeks ago, and we're aiming for 250,000 by the end of October. So how does it work? It works the same way as it did last year. For every hundred dollars donated by your donor, that that hundred dollars goes wherever that donor directs it to go to your chapter. Um, we're asking chapters to raise money for your chapter, not project specific, because some of you are getting a lot of money for these projects and you can't spend it, and then you're hands are tied unless you go back to that donor and say, can I spend it on this other project? So we're asking you to all raise money for your chapters doing projects such as whatever projects you're doing. But the first hundred dollars goes where that donor directs it to go. The second hundred dollars, half of that will go to the headquarters office, half of that will go to your project. So you can start at hundred and get to 150. And that's as long as that match holds out and we're going to limit chapters to $10,000. So how do you prepare for that campaign? You organize your mailing list, including all your emails and addresses. You start that fundraising campaign online, so your fundraising page online. Only donations given through that timeline and that page will count towards the match. You're going to encourage your donors to give early, and like voting, give often um, for the match, but you also want them to give to reach that campaign goal. And you want to go strong until January 15th, because your chapter could get an additional $5,000 in prize money if you have the most donors or the most funding raised amongst all the chapters. As I said, the rules will be announced it says here October 31st. I really think it's November 15th. Somewhere between those two dates. We'll send out a special membership e-blast that start your fundraising page. Make sure that's up and online. 
And if you haven't become a member, your life will be changed in immeasurable ways. All good, I promise. And you'll change communities' lives forever. So you can learn more about becoming a member at our website. And then connect in. If you haven't noticed on the homepage of our website, we have Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts, YouTube accounts. Google is becoming a large supporter of ours, so Colleen's going to have a how to get connected with Google tool session for you all. And we've got surveys out there. So tell us what you think. We want to know. We want to know what things we need to improve or what things we need to create. And I'd like to thank all of our partners, because even though you all have local chapter partners and local conference partners, these are the sustainable partners who allow headquarters to function. They provide the base funding so that we can be there for you. And they really deserve a round of applause.
Uh, so I'd like to just show a little video to, to give a little bit more of a framework uh, of, of what, what it is that we do, just to kind of lay a little bit more of the landscape. To surfing being a multi-billion dollar industry, and some people actually refer to Glenn Henry, the founder of the Surfrider Foundation, refers to uh, surfing as a, an apparel industry with a good hook. Uh, because of the, the, uh, the prevalence of surf apparel. And, uh, for me, surfing is, is something I get passionate about, and I actually found surfing a little bit later in life. Uh, but uh, I want to use this telling my story to challenge you to think about what is your surfing and what's, what's surfing to you or what can be an equivalent of, of surfing for you and, and to find your surf. So I grew up in, in upstate New York uh, riding go-karts and, and horses. I was part of the 4-H club. Any, any other 4-H's? Nice, okay, a few. Uh, I think it fits perfectly as well to be learned by doing both with Cal Poly and 4-H. Uh, so, they have a pledge, I still remember it to this day, I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to greater service, and my health to better living. And for me, this was really, it really impacted my life as I was riding horses and uh, learning skills that would help me in my life, whether it be um, arts and crafts, or it just be handicrafts. Uh, and of course, I was part of the Ponies and Horses 4-H Club, and I, I promise you the pictures do get better. <laughs> One of the things that, that also stuck out with me was the uh, presentations that, that our club uh, required us to do. And that was about a 15-minute presentation where we didn't have PowerPoints, but rather these big poster boards with marker them out by hand. And, uh, it was terrifying as a kid. Here we are, eight years old, you had to get in front of people. Uh, and here I am today talking about my experience uh, as uh, public presentations in, uh, in 4-H. Uh, but as I grew up, uh, valuing that experience, valuing riding on horses, uh, I thought it was a lot cooler to ride snowboards than horses by the time I hit about 14. And uh, that was, for me, I feel like I'm like 20 feet in the air, but I read this picture on fire or something. It's okay, though. Uh, uh, that, for me, was, it was finding this, it was discovering this uh, action sports that really uh, made me 
made me tick. It seemed to really uh, resonate with me. And, and having that experience of being on a snowboard, being in the air, riding powder, if any of you snowboarded or skied, have been in powder, know that feeling. Well, in high school, uh, a friend of mine and I, we were able to get sponsored by Solo Snowboards through sending pictures like this, believe it or not. This was a long time ago, so the, the level has increased quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the Solo Snowboards, much like the, uh, there's two kinds of sponsorships. One's with the A team, they got everything for free. Uh, and then there's the B team, they got deeply discounted uh, gear, and that's where, where I fit in. And, I didn't really take it too seriously in terms of the sponsorship. Oh, okay, they didn't give me discounted gear. Sweet, I'm going to roll with it. As I graduated high school, I thought, well, well what's the next adventure? What, what can I do to continue to snowboard and to continue on my, my adventure of life? And so I ended up in Colorado State. Uh, I had uh, an aunt and uncle out at Fort Collins. So I went there, and I knew that there was good mountains in Colorado, as you might imagine. And I was able to practice the, uh, the sport of snowboarding. And so as you can see here, I took it to another level uh, by, of course, snowboarding off the roof. And I've done it a couple of times, getting a little cocky. I was like, I'm going to take that shirt off and put a beer in my hand. I, I didn't spill any of the beer, by the way. Uh, in addition to snowboarding off the roofs, um, I, I did have an opportunity to go surfing for the first time. And I lived with a, a number of guys. They were from San Diego. And they were, they were big surfers. But the one guy... Talk about the epitome of a surfer. Blonde hair, totally ripped guy. And uh, I was like, oh, this guy's you know, really nice. Uh, didn't know much about surfing, so he invited me out for, uh, it was for Thanksgiving one day, or one, one year in college. And so he's like, all right, we only have one surfboard, and there's three of us that wanted to go. So he's like, okay, here's the plan. I'm going to paddle out past the break. Then you guys just swim out, meet up, and we'll be able to switch off the board. We can all use the board when we get out there. Well, it didn't really work out so well. Uh, that was probably the closest, I've, one of the closest times I've come to drowning. And uh, the, the other guy I was with that didn't have the surfboard, we both, we got pounded, we got back to shore, and we were just like, okay, I don't think I'm going to surf again. The reason I mention this, though, is that uh, it was, my first experience with surfing was, was pretty much terrible. But here I am, uh, related to it on a daily basis. So you may have some kind of experience that doesn't go so well. Maybe the first trip that you go on isn't uh, what you expected it to be. But that's not uh, enough reason to give up on it. And so to, to keep going through that. I, I studied in France, uh, and that was a big part of my international experience. The, I would encourage uh, people to, to do that, to look at the study abroad opportunities if, if it's available to you. Uh, Ended up in, in the capital of the French Alps with the snowboarding. You can see a theme emerging here, uh, Grenoble. But I was also learning French, and uh, I don't want to sound like a, a complete snowboard bum, so I, I think it's worth mentioning here that I did get some recognition in, in college. I finished with a 3.8, uh, was the treasurer of the Business College Council. I invited to participate in the President's Leadership Program and was awarded the Outstanding Senior Award for the College of Business. Uh, I wanted to take these things and take this experience and put it to toward the next big adventure. And just like Kathy had been in the Peace Corps, it seemed like for me that this going abroad, going internationally, and I had this desire to, to do good somehow. I didn't know what it was. I really looked at uh, graduation as I could go two routes. One, I could go into the business world and uh, take what I've learned in, in college and try and make a bunch of money to be able to, to have more time well, later in life, or more money, to do the things that I want. Or, alternatively, I could really try and make an impact, uh, maybe not have the same kind of financial sustainability or, or the financial um, uh, strength of a well-paying job right away, but to make an impact, to try and help others, and, and within the hopes of earning that, uh, that better income later in life. Well, I ended up uh, getting invited to, or, or there was talk of me being invited to go to a program in the Caribbean. I said, well, no, I don't really want to go to the Caribbean. I don't know what I was thinking at that point. It's the Caribbean, it's warm. I said, no, I want to use my French minor. I, I'm studying French for a reason. I want to use that. So I ended up in West Africa, in Mauritania. So I said, if you want to go to Mauritania, you can speak French there. I said, where's Mauritania? Of course, I found it on the map. I was like, oh, well, it's pretty close to the Sahara Desert, but yeah, let me, let me check it out. And so I was all about using my, my French uh, minor to 
to, to more solidify those skills of another language. And the journey isn't always easy. I have a couple of words up here that, to help um, guide the discussion or guide the, uh, the talk here, but it was, it was a harsh environment. And uh, I had, of course, it was in the, the Celsius, 51 degrees centigrade. That is pretty warm. I had to actually look at the Fahrenheit. Over 120 degrees. If you ever walk into a sauna, it kind of burns your nose. There was days that we were uh, outside and like, you can't do anything. That's between one and four. You were just laying down on your mat. Um, so that was a challenge to be able to get things done given the, the environment. Another challenge was that 9 11 happened. Uh, at the time, uh, it was the only Islamic Republic that the Peace Corps was in, and there was some threats against Americans. Where I was living, the, uh, the World Vision Director had a, a threat against him. And then the World Vision Country Director in the Waukesha, the capital, uh, was on the beach and he got shot. Uh, fortunately, he ended up okay. The bullet went through his arm and got lodged into the chest of his daughter, who were met back to Paris, and, and uh, ended up being okay. As Captain knows, the Peace Corps takes uh, volunteer security very seriously. They consolidated us, which is the uh, the step before evacuation. And uh, basically what they said there, hey, it's an exciting time to be in the Peace Corps. We understand that this might not be the place for you. Uh, they offered what they called interrupted service, the same thing as completing service, uh, but just at a time before your scheduled uh, termination, uh, close of service date. But they also said there's other places in the world that are, are looking for more Peace Corps volunteers. They're looking for uh, Peace Corps to come back to new countries, to come to new countries or to go back to countries that they've already been in. Peru is one of these countries, Alejandro Toledo had just recently been elected uh, president of the country. He had lived with Peace Corps volunteers growing up, which allowed him through the connections to go to the States on a scholarship, uh, Stanford University, Harvard University. And uh, he became president, he said, I want the Peace Corps to come back to Peru. I was like, that's a fascinating story, I want to I be part of that. Can I go to Peru as a Peace Corps volunteer? Well, I realized that it was going to be uh, a number of years before that could, could potentially come to fruition. But I went back to the, uh, my site, and when I went back, I realized that the place I was living had been broken into. And apparently some of the neighbor kids were borrowing some of my items uh, while I was gone. I, I ended up getting most of the things back, but I started thinking about how much could I accomplish or be part of accomplishing there in 12 months versus 24 uh, in, the, in another location. So I started looking at well, what kind of other opportunities are there out there? And a lot of the job uh, descriptions that seemed interesting to me, they all required a master's degree in Spanish. And so I thought, well, this whole international development thing was very interesting to me. And I, I didn't feel that my work there was done, or that I, there was so much more to learn. And so I found out about the, the master's international program. And I ended up uh, leaving Mauritania uh, after 14 months there, with the idea of going back. Well, I ended up uh, in that time of reapplying to the Peace Corps, applying to the master's program, which is where you combine it, a master's international, combine a Peace Corps service with a master's degree. Um, so I ended up in Vermont, in northern Vermont at JP. And uh, here was one of the jobs that I had at the mountain. Uh, this was actually a, a big air contest. Or a, and uh, I don't always wear one-piece suits. Uh, but it was, it was an opportunity to explore different parts of the mountain. And I think if you look at my resume now, you can still see the uh, vehicular location engineer job title, uh, park cars. And then there was the <laughs> passenger delivery specialist, which was uh, where I, I helped uh, load chairs, in addition to uh, DJing some of the, some of the downhill events. Um, but it, it can be really fun going back, even if there is the, uh, the point here is the, the culture shock, or more spoken is the reverse culture shock and it was a big difference to go from the environment of Mauritania where uh, the food choices were pretty much rice and maybe a little bit of carrot and would go uh, to going to the food store in the states where there's 30 kinds of cereals that you can choose from and it was kind of mind-blowing for me I, I think I was uh, a fairly healthy outlet of snowboarding uh, but that's something to think about uh, as you go to, to places new places in the world uh, coming back, you, you'll likely have a different perspective on where you came from. But at the same time, there's, there's no limits on what you can do. Uh, and I say that in relation to 
uh, the job I got at the Hatter Sound Surf Shop. So we finished up the ski season, and of course we're like, let's go to the beach. Finish up, put closure to the ski season, go to the beach, uh, and then kind of figure it out from there. Well, I found that Barton at the Hatter Sound Surf Shop hadn't opened his surf shop the year before because he was focusing on the sailing site and the kiteboarding. He was going through the new trends in the industry. And so uh, he's like, I'll give you 10, uh, I'll give you a place to stay for 10 hours a week to work at the shop. And myself and uh, two others, those sounds pretty good to us, uh, we didn't have any experience running a surf shop. I didn't even surf at the time. But it was something that we wanted to do. And there was uh, this desire and, and willingness to put ourselves out there and, and kind of figure it out, learn by doing, so to speak. And that's uh, something that I think it should be a take home as well, that you can, you can do it by, by just putting yourself in it. There's no limits. Uh, finishing up at the, at the Hatter Sound Surf Shop, uh, and again, once again, I, I wasn't a total slacker during those times. I was completing the applications for graduate school, but I was accepted to the, the School for International Training. And uh, nice, I think there was someone else who was Who's here? All right, uh, Pim sixty three. So uh, now that I, I really found my surf, now what, what do I do with that? Uh, this this surfing thing that I that I go and surfing every day, and um, it was a dynamic environment. Uh, well, now what can I do for this? I found this another passion of mine. What can I do with it? Uh, and so I, I put it out to you. What, what kind of classes do you like? Uh, how can you blend with some of your passions with the purpose? that you're learning through through school, that you're learning through the Engineers Without Borders, that you're learning in Panama or in Indonesia or Guatemala, wherever the project sites may be. Uh, I know for myself, some of the classes that most impacted my life in uh, at, at the School for International Training in Brattleboro was the uh, social entrepreneurship and framing out ways to, what's the landscape for doing a feasibility planning for starting an organization uh, so I wanted to, I, I finished up, it was a one-year program, went back to the, the surf shop uh, again before, uh, before the, the next thing, and that was going to be the Peace Corps again. But I wanted to take some of the, the, the things that I learned from uh, the schooling, from the past experience at the surf shop, from the hospitality industry, from the tourism industry, uh, from the surf industry, and how could I apply that uh, in another situation? Well, I went back to the Peace Corps, was accepted to the Peru program, uh, part of the second volunteers, uh, second group of volunteers to go back after that 28 year absence. And it was here that I was really able to get my hands dirty. I lived in northern Peru uh, with coffee farmers. And this was a, a fantastic opportunity to visit this place in the world that I probably otherwise wouldn't, but I, I also wanted to be useful. I wanted to apply those learnings uh, that I was uh, that I'd experienced in both graduate school and then in in Vermont. And so I, I realized that the, the farmers, in talking to them, they were so proud of their chakras or their fields or their, their farms that they had. And they loved to talk about the four different kinds of bananas that they have there and uh, what makes their, you know, their coffee organic. And it's beyond the absence of chemicals. And so for me, it was, it was an amazing learning opportunity. But I said, well, for me, this is awesome. And I know that there's other folks like myself that would want to go and experience that. I also realized that in talking to them that they would pull their kids out of school during the coffee harvest because it was like all hands on deck. We need to harvest this coffee. This is what we're living off of. Uh, and so they pulled their kids out of school. And they pulled, you know, for the, the community to develop, the education is such a key part of that. What about if we had some volunteers that could come in during those peak times in exchange for food and lodging to be able to be part of the coffee harvest? So this was a, a conversation over many months. And, uh, I think one of the, the legacies of that time that was connecting uh, a volunteer agency with these small groups of farmers. And uh, again, I was coming from the, the, the surf environment of North Carolina, and so in Peru I was, of course, uh, surfing. I had a, a moral dilemma as to when I was leaving for Peru, do I bring my surfboard or not? I show, here I am, this guy who shows up with a surfboard into the Peace Corps, you know, what kind of message is that sending? And so I just, I'm not going to bring a surfboard. I'll just play low key. I'm going to be able to figure out how to get surfboards. Uh, but I knew that the, the surfing thing for me was something that could continue on in this piece for a service. And as I was thinking about the, the tourism uh, in northern Peru, the coffee farms, uh, who are the tourists that want to go visit? And so where was tourism happening in Peru? 
And it was on the coast, in northern Peru in particular, it was on the coast. And so the idea, this creativity, uh, the trying to blend the, the different experiences that I had went from uh, taking the uh, coffee to the coast, and then taking the coast to the coffee. Taking the coffee to where the tourists were, and seeing what the interest level was there. I like a good cup of coffee. So I thought, well, I know other surfers that, that do uh, as well. And so then the, the next step was to take the, the coast to the coffee, take the tourists to, the, to where the coffee was uh, being produced, and uh, had that volunteer component. My Peace Corps service ended up getting extended. Uh, I extended it on purpose because as part of the Master's International program, you have to write a paper, a capstone research project. Uh, two years in, and I had a pretty good idea about the one, uh, one case study I wanted to use, didn't quite have the second one, uh, so I wanted to stay on with the Peace Corps. I was invited to serve as the volunteer coordinator for the Environmental Action and Awareness Program. And through that, it was the uh, Peru, we always partner with local agencies, the Peruvian Foundation for the Conservation of Nature, uh, they were also interested in the coffee tourism idea. Only their projects were in the Pacaya Samaria National Reserve. And this is where the Yucayali and the Marañón rivers come together to form the headwaters of the Amazon River. Beautiful area. And they had these projects that were going on with uh, conservation projects that involved climbing trees to harvest the coffee, or excuse me, harvest the, um, the dates and the fruit from the trees, but the way they were doing that was just cutting down the trees. There's a ton of these trees here, we're just going to cut them down to harvest the, the fruits. And so what they were working with them was, if you climb the trees, you can harvest it that way, and then the trees still there can produce again next year. And this was kind of mind-blowing for me, that, that wow, it seems pretty simple. Uh, but it, the idea was to include, or look for ways to include volunteers in that process, whether it be through financial means, or uh, whether it be tracking the uh, some of the documentation elements, uh, certain elements were needed for the volunteers to be there. Uh, Spanish was a big one. Uh, it's a fascinating area. It's some of the biggest, largest freshwater fish, the fish, 500 pounds, uh, have to come up to breathe. These kinds of things were interesting. I knew they weren't just interesting to me, but to other volunteers that would want to be involved. So it was crafting and creating a way for uh, adventure conservation and for the uh, the organization to incorporate volunteer elements into it. And so I wrote about it in uh, Sustainable Tourism Realities, A Case for Adventure Service Tourism, which was my, my thesis. Uh, I also realized this, uh, and I think a, a big take home point here is that uh, we started that program together, put it up on a website, had it all described, but it's much more than a website for a program to be successful. And, uh, and so right now, that, that program, the Adventure Conservation, is, not, is no longer being offered uh, in the Pacaya Samaria. But that's an important thing to, to realize, that sometimes not everything goes as planned, and there's, and there's setbacks. But I, I look to you and say, well, what do you, what do you want to create? And uh, for me, I wanted to, I wanted to be involved in, in surfing. I wanted to be involved in sustainable development. And I thought, if, man, if there's anyone that's going to be doing this, I want to be part of it. So there was an idea that a number of us got, and, that, and talking to folks, as we realized, here we are going to surf in a community. Um, surfboards are not cheap. They can range from $500 to $1,000. Uh, wetsuits aren't cheap. Uh, and so here we are, a lot of times it was foreigners, whether it was from Lima or from other places, going to a community to go surfing. And we, we're coming in with all this, these luxury goods. And yet the kids who lived there, had the resource in their backyard, didn't have, a, have access to that. We also realized that uh, the graduation rates of uh, school were really low. About 30% of the kids graduated. In talking to both the community members, we, we were talking to the kids who were like, we're stoked about going to surf, and can, when can we go, can I borrow your board? And like, yeah. So what we did was we looked to, uh, to do something more with that, and to, uh, to facilitate the experience of surfing for some of the locals that we had, and so we asked a number of surf companies, "Hey, can you uh, can you give us a couple boards? There's just, uh, world class waves here in Lobitos. There's uh, there's kids who, who can't afford boards. Can you help us out?" And uh, I'll get into some more of the details of this, but we ended up getting a surfboard donation, and uh, we'll talk a little more about this corporate aloha. But we started planning right in the, in the beginning from that, those first experiences in 2004, talking to the community. 
And it was really blending that, that passion for surfing with the purpose of uh, taking the, the Peace Corps experiences, taking the, some things we've learned about sustainable development, uh, and putting them into practice. And that, here it is, the, the corporate level. Where Mark Kelly responded uh, positively and said, well, what's your vision for this? Said, well, we don't want to be a handout organization. We don't want to just give people things. We want them to do something to get something. So it's a give to gain philosophy. So maybe participate in a beach cleanup in exchange for a surf class. Um, uh, offer English classes and then you go surfing. And so how do we arrive at that? Well, there's a the process of going back and forth. And again, uh, I, I use the word grit because it's, it's hustling. It's hustling for good in our sense. Uh, it was working from both the, the local side in Peru uh, as well as the international side of getting this donation of surfboards in. And uh, the, do the donation went from five to ten boards to a hundred boards to a whole shipping container full of boards. Mark Kelly says, uh, all right, I'm just going to need $5,000 so we can ship the boards from Thailand, get the boards to Peru, we'll be all set. Um, just you send me the $5,000 and let me know where to send them. I'm like, uh, I'm in the Peace Corps, and all the other guys that I'm talking to this about, they're not coming from means to come up with $5,000. Well, nine people at the company donated a paycheck to be able to ship the boards. And this was, it, this was not a, a portion of their distribution at all. Global Surf Industries was not in Peru. It was just a pure philanthropy. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the corporate aloha went back and forth, got uh, people involved. And so we started talking. We're not experts on Peru, so we started looking to the Peruvian Surfing Federation. Uh, who do they know? And they said, well, the, the uh, Peruvian Sports Institute, which oversees all the federations, also was interested in this. They're like, wait, 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 you have 400 surfboards? Okay, let's we'll see what we can do. It ended up being the Ministry of Education that got the boards in as education.